Hey everyone, welcome to the Neo4j stream. My name is Will, and today we are going to be looking at live coding some graph data visualizations uh, using GraphQL as our data source. Let me, oh, my sound looks a little off. Let me tweak my sound here in just a sec. Okay, there we go. Hopefully that's better for the sound. Cool, so um, this is kind of a, a continuation on a project we've been working on on the previous streams that I've been calling the lobsters graph. Uh, so let me drop a link to the code in the chat. There we go. So this is kind of um, picking up from where we left off last time. Uh, so let me let me maybe talk a little bit about what we've been building. Uh, if you missed the previous episodes, that, that's fine. This one is going to be pretty self-contained since we're starting the front end piece of the journey here. Um, so don't worry about that. But for context, let me just talk a little bit about um, what we worked on previously. So there's this site called Lobsters. Just let me link to that in the chat as well. So Lobsters is, and I'll zoom in a bit too, um, Lobsters is an online news aggregator focused on news for programmers, uh, really, and developers. So anyone can post to Lobsters and then the community kind of upvotes, downvotes and comments on it and, and so, what, so on. Uh, and one interesting aspect is that in order to participate in Lobsters, so anyone can go there and sort of see the, the top feed uh, and click and read these articles, but you have to be invited by someone who's a member in order to post new articles or make comments. Uh, which kind of keeps it a little more civil, I think, is the is the goal there. So you can think of lobsters as like a, a more civil version of Hacker News, perhaps. Uh, at least that's how I think of it. Um, so I thought it would be uh, really neat because there, there's a lot of interesting articles and content and um, things posted to lobsters that kind of go away over time because this is a dynamic uh feed essentially that kind of changes over time. So I thought it would be interesting to capture what articles are being posted, uh, what users are posting them, the, the meta information about the articles, capture that in Neo4j and see if we could build uh, an interactive visual uh, application that's focused more on a visual way of exploring Lobster's data. Uh, and so what we've done so far is take the lobsters JSON endpoints. So there's, uh, if you go to just lobster, lobster.rs uh, slash newest.json, uh, you'll see a JSON feed for the newest articles that were submitted. And then there's also, um, I think, what, hottest.json? Yeah, which is uh, basically the, the top articles in the feed. So if we look at this JSON document and compare that to what's uh, on the front page of the leaderboard right now, that's basically where that data is coming from. So we took these JSON endpoints and we set up a GitHub action. Uh, so here's the, the code on GitHub. Again, let me zoom in a little bit. We set up a GitHub action here. Uh, using this really cool GitHub action called flat data. Um, so flat data will, this is a GitHub action that was published by GitHub, uh, and it allows us to give a URL for a file and set a cron task. So in this case, this is every 60 minutes. Uh, we're going out and grabbing this file the newest JSON, and then we also do the same for the hottest.json. 
and we check that data into this GitHub repo. So we have uh, in Git history like all of the uh, all of the data checked in, uh, and then I wrote a GitHub action called flat graph, which allows us to basically just point to a Neo4j Aura instance. So Neo4j Aura hosted Neo4j instance in the cloud somewhere. And with a Cypher query, define how I want to transform that data that we just imported or that we just checked into the repo with the flat data action. And basically use this Cypher query to create data in the graph. So this is constantly running uh, every 60 minutes and updating our Neo4j Aura database with both the latest and the hottest articles, who submitted them, uh, what tags they have, so we kind of know what they're about. So kind of like a, like a knowledge graph of Lobster's articles, um, which I think is pretty neat. So we did that on the first session. Um, there's, let's see. There's, yeah, here we go. There's a blog post uh, write-up of this, as well as the, the live stream video uh, that you can check out that talks about how to use GitHub Actions in that way and, and then talks a little bit about the, I think down at the end here, the flat graph GitHub Action uh, that's in the GitHub Marketplace. It, it's kind of a, a simple action that I wrote that's basically just taking your connection credentials for a Neo4j Aura instance and reading the JSON file that was previously checked into the repo. So it's meant to work with this flat data action uh, and then allows you to just write this Cypher query in YAML that says how to work with that data to uh, save that data, update it in Neo4j Aura. Behind the scenes, all it's doing is really just making a connection to your Neo4j Aura instance, passing the JSON file as a parameter. So the Cypher parameter value is just that JSON object. And then in the YAML file, you can just write the Cypher query that defines how you want to handle that data for creating data in the graph. OK, so that's what we did in the first uh, the first series, first in our series uh, here, then we we know we want to build this full stack application really because because the end goal here is I want this interactive visualization sort of graph focused way of interacting with and exploring the lobsters data. Ultimately, what what I kind of want to demonstrate is how graph visualization and, and data data visualization in general are really powerful for working with knowledge graph data for being able to discover interesting content uh, and, and this sort of thing. So that's our end goal. So in the first step, we set up our data import to scrape lobsters every hour. So that's continuously updating in Neo4j Aura. And then in the second uh, episode, we built a GraphQL server using Next.js. So Next.js is a, a full stack React framework. Um, I like to think of it's it's built and maintained by the folks at Vercel, who have a, a cloud platform uh, where we can also host and deploy our Next.js app. So we use the Neo4j GraphQL library, which allows us to build GraphQL APIs backed by Neo4j. Uh, we use that library to basically define some GraphQL type definitions that map to the data that we have in Neo4j Aura. And then we have a GraphQL API uh, using the uh, API route feature in Next.js. So Next.js is it's thought of really as a React framework, but I think of it as really a full stack React framework because it does have this concept of API routes. So we can define endpoints uh, and deploy those as serverless functions with Vercel. So we did that uh, in the most recent episode. So that's kind of where we left off. 
So what I want to do today is take this GraphQL API that we built and deployed and build a graph visualization of the most recent Lobster's articles, including maybe like the, the tags, the user who submitted them, and add that to our next JS application and see if we can deploy that. Uh, so that will be kind of the starting point. I don't think we'll I don't think we'll get to the end result today, uh, but I think we will at least get everything set up and have kind of the basic graph visualization uh, set up that we wanted to. Uh, that we'll then sort of play around with later to to improve perhaps. So I'm going to use this React Force Graph library for our graph visualization. Um, this, I've, I've only used it a little bit. Uh, I've used the, the non-React version of this. So this is the React package is a wrapper around this force graph uh, library, uh, which is really nice for creating force graph layouts of, of graph visualization. There, there's also a, this is the 2D version that uses Canvas but there's also um, 3D versions and then a, an augmented reality version as well. Uh, that So the 3D version is GPU accelerated using uh, WebGL. We'll just use, I think, the, the 2D canvas version today. Um, but basically, if we look at some examples here, we can look at the, the basic example. Uh, so we can sort of zoom in. This is a this is a three D example, which we're not going to do. Let's look at the the two D examples. Uh, this medium sized graph one, I think, is a good one. Yeah. So something something like this is what we're after, where we we're sort of seeing the data in a force directed layout, and we can interact it with it a bit. We can click on nodes, and in our case, that'll take us to the article, uh, perhaps. We want to see maybe like the user who submitted it, um, what tags the article has, and we want to be able to add more data. So we want to be able to say like click on a tag if it's the you know databases tag, uh, and I want to see more articles that have the databases tag. So that, that's what I mean by interactive, so that we can sort of explore the data on our own, but rendered as a graph visualization. Uh, and that data will be populated by querying our GraphQL API. So that's what we're after today. Uh, let's take a look at our database. So I'm using Near4j Aura for this project. I'll drop a link to that in the chat, which is hosted Neo4j, so database as a service. So these are Neo4j instances in the cloud that I can spin up, query, scale, uh, this sort of thing. Uh, there's a free version um, which we can use. I don't think I'm using the free tier instance for this. I think my free tier instance is, yeah, on some other project. Uh, let's open this up. So here's our lobsters graph database in the Aura console. I've got a few other projects. We'll um, maybe take a look at some of those other ones later on. But I want to, what I want to do is take a look at uh, this data in Neo4j and look at one, how we query it with Cypher and Neo4j browser, just, just really briefly to sort of see how we use graph visualization and force directed layouts in Neo4j browser. And then I want to do the same in Bloom just to kind of get an idea of how those tools fit in with graph visualization and kind of what's available for us out of the box and kind of why we're building our own uh, graph visualization as part of this React application. So let me find my password. I've saved somewhere. Here it is. Okay, so we're going to sign in to our Aura instance in the F J browser. 
And the first thing we can do here is call db schema dot visualization, and this will give us kind of the uh, the meta model. Let's reset the styles there. There we go. So, so sometimes you'll notice the the captions for your nodes don't show. Um, and oftentimes if you run that colon style reset command, that resets the styling for the visualization. And there's some defaults for the properties that are used as the caption in the FJ browser. So oftentimes that uh, will get the captions back. You can also configure it manually, but I, I find that a bit easier. So we have a pretty basic model for our lobsters data that we're working with. So we have article nodes. Uh, an article can have one or more tags. So this is some grouping that describes what the article is about, like databases, APIs, Swift, SQL, that kind of thing. And then the user who submitted it. And then we also have this invited by relationship because in, like I said, in lobsters, to be able to participate, you have to have been invited by a member of Lobsters already. So we capture that data when we do the data import as well. So if I take a look at, let's look at some articles here. So here are some article nodes. We can see the data that we've, we're capturing about each one, the URL, the uh, the title and so on. And if I expand this a bit, if I start to add data to the visualization, we can see that there is a, what's called force directed layout for uh, how these nodes are laid out and rendered on the screen. And what that means is that there's this algorithm called the force directed layout algorithm uh, that is sort of simulating kind of like a like a physics simulation. So there are some forces at play here. Uh, each one of these relationships is kind of like a spring. So it's drawing the nodes that are connected closer together, but then nodes, all pairs of nodes have sort of uh, repulsion, like electrons that are that are like pushing each other away. And what what's really nice about this is it results in this layout where you don't really have to understand or don't have to have inputs to the layout algorithm, any information about the graph. So I don't have to know like how the nodes are clustered by like label or property value or thing like anything like that. But I end up with some sort of layout that I can look at at a glance and kind of start to see how nodes uh, maybe are clustered together uh, and that is useful for, visual, for visualization because I can start to, at a glance, sort of start to get some information about the structure of the network. Now, I, I can't just use Neo4j Browser for this project because Neo4j Browser is a developer tool. So it, it's largely intended for developers who are writing Cypher queries. And I get these more small scale visualizations to sort of interpret the results. There is another tool called Neo4j Bloom, and that's available here. So if I go back to the Aura console, and if I go now to open with Neo4j Bloom, Bloom is an application that I can share maybe with the end user of my graph and give them sort of like a, a user interface that they can use to explore and interact with the graph data. So with Bloom, I don't need to know Cypher. Bloom has this kind of natural language like search interface. So let's say I want to search for uh, users who uh, submitted articles uh, where the tag uh, where the tag name, there we go, uh, is databases. So I didn't have to write Cypher to find that. I just wrote this 
sort of natural language like syntax. Uh, and I can see here all of the users who have submitted articles with the tag database. Uh, I can view detailed information. Again, I have like the link to the article, things like that. I can style this. So I think, I think we did this in the previous uh, live stream where we styled these according to property value. So I think for article, we created a rule-based style based on uh, a property value. Oh yeah, based on score. So we have the score that's basically some function based on the upvote number of upvotes and time to decide how high it should be ranked. Uh, so articles with a higher score are larger, I think similar for users based on karma um, and so on. And, and that's nice because then at a glance I can start to see, oh, well, this uh, looks like the highest rated database article uh, that we have. Um, and I can also work with this interactively and visually. So I can like ex select every node and expand, let's just expand all the other nodes. So that adds uh, one hop out from all of these nodes uh, and I can cont continue doing that. So Bloom is GPU accelerated. So it's meant to, to work with larger graphs, uh, which, is, which is quite nice. Um, we could use Bloom f for part of our application. Um, what I'm looking for though is something that combines some other elements. So I, I want a bit more custom experience, I guess, in this application that we're building. Uh, and Bloom is really this, this standalone application. So we, we could give a user Bloom hosted online, uh, connected to our lobsters data, but I want to build something a bit more bespoke, I guess. So that's why we're not going to use Bloom uh, and instead build our own visualization as part of this React application. Okay, cool. So close that. We've already looked at those. Uh, so let's jump over to our Next.js application. Um, I'll just do a, let's make this a bit bigger. I'll just do a yarn dev to start this up. So that will start this running on port 3000. And it looks like, so there's a couple things going on here. One is the front end piece of our Next.js application, which looks like this is just the default page that we get. And if we take a look here at the file structure, so this next directory, I have a couple things. I have my GitHub action uh, YAML here, and then I have a next directory that has our Next.js app in it. And with next, we have this file-based router. So in the pages directory, uh, every file that I create gets mapped to a route. So what we're seeing is index.js, which is just kind of the default when you first create a Next.js project. Uh, this is what you see. There's also, we talked about the API routes. So pages, API, GraphQL. This is our GraphQL endpoint that we built last time with the Neo4j GraphQL library. Uh, which let me link to that as well. The near j GraphQL library, since that's an important piece of our tech stack here. But basically, the near j GraphQL library allows us to write some GraphQL type definitions and then generate a fully functional GraphQL API based on just those type definitions. We don't have to write what are called resolver functions, where the actual logic for going out and fetching the data from the database. Uh, at query time, the database queries are generated for us based on any arbitrary GraphQL requests. So this is super useful for getting a GraphQL API up and running 
fully functional very quickly. Um, so let's take a look, localhost 3000 slash API slash GraphQL. So this is GraphQL Playground, which is like a, like an in-browser tool for querying and exploring GraphQL APIs. Uh, and here's like this is a leftover query we ran last time. So this says find uh, just 10 articles, return the ID and the URL for the article. And this is talking to our Neo4j Aura instance that we looked at earlier. So that, that's where the data is coming from. If we look in the console here, we can see some, uh, some things in the debug log that is showing us the generated cipher query. So this is the generated cipher query based on this GraphQL query. Uh, and if we add other fields here, like maybe we want the user who submitted this and maybe other um, articles. Let's just grab the first five other articles that that user has submitted. Uh, as we add more fields, now we can see that the generated cipher query is a bit more complex based on the GraphQL query that we submitted. So that's sort of this dynamic GraphQL to cipher transpilation that's going on. Um, okay, and I think I think this is live. We I think we deployed this on Vercel. So I think anyone can query this now. Let's see what the URL for this is. Is it just lobsters graph? Lobsters graph.vercel.app. So if we go slash API slash GraphQL, then yeah, then anyone should be able to query this right now. So I'll drop a link to that in the chat. Feel free to play around with that uh, as well. Okay, cool. So we know where our GraphQL API is. We know this is the React component page that we want to replace. That's our sort of default content. Um, let's, I think we can get rid of pretty much all of this. We don't need any CSS for now. Let's just uh, return a div. There we go, cool. And give that a format, okay, great. So, um, what we want to do is now replace this with a graph visualization, uh, with data coming from our GraphQL API. So I guess the first thing we should do is set up the react force graph, uh, package. Uh, this is force graph. I want react force graph. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so if we look at the quick start, there's... 2D, 3D, VR, and AR versions. I, let's just do the 2D version. Uh, so I'm going to do yarn add react force graph 2D. And while that's installing, um, we're going to do something that may be a little unfamiliar. I hadn't really come across this much before, but we're going to need to do a dynamic import for uh, bringing in the React Force Graph package because uh, we'll need to disable server-side rendering. So Next.js um, by default will try to server-side render our pages. Um, that means turn the JavaScript into HTML before sending it over the wire. Uh, and that doesn't work 
with Forcegraph because that needs to run in your browser. It needs access to uh, like the window object to do some things to manipulate the DOM. So we're gonna set up this dynamic import um, to basically disable SSR uh, and ensure that we're not trying to render our graph visualization on the server. So what I'm gonna do is create this lib directory. Actually, let's not do it in pages. Let's do it here. Uh, and then in lib, mm, let's call this, I don't know, no SSR force graph. And all this is gonna do is import force graph 2D from React Force Graph 2D and export it. And then here in index.js, I can say import uh, dynamic. So this is the, this will now allow us to do a dynamic import. I'm gonna import no SSR force graph dynamic import. And here's where we're gonna import from that lib no SSR force graph. And then I need to say uh, SSR false to disable server-side rendering. Cool. Uh, and then we can return no SSR the force graph component here. Okay, so that's bringing in the React Force Graph component, uh, but we need some data before we can render it. Uh, so if we look at the structure uh, for the graph data, so this is a graph data prop, is an object that has the nodes and links uh, as well. Is there? Let's look at an example here. Oh, this is reading from data sets, random data. Okay, cool. Let's look at data sets, random data. Um, okay, so this is randomizing some data. We'll, we'll just like, let's just hard code an object here. Um, it's basically something like this. Uh, so an object with two keys, nodes, which is an array, and links, which is an array. And then uh, every node needs to have an ID. So let's create three nodes here, A, B, and C. Oops, forgot a curly brace there. A, B, oh, there's the curly brace, okay. And C, and then uh, our links are going to have a source and a target. So a link is, or a relationship is going to go from one node to another. So let's have a relationship from A to B and then also I don't know, from C uh, to back to A. 
something like that. And then we'll pass that as a prop. What was the prop name? Graph data, I think it was called. Go back to the docs here. Yeah, graph data. So we'll say graph data equals what we call this, my data. And oh, let's start our next app. So you're in dev. And now we should see once this compiles. Yeah, cool. So we have a very simple graph visualization with some hard coded data here. Okay, so that's a start. I mean, we can we can zoom in, we can move this around. So we have like A, B, C, A to B, C to A. Cool. So that's hard-coded data though. We want to pull in data for our uh, lobsters graph data. So this is not super helpful. Um, what we want to do now though is set up Apollo client. Uh, so Apollo client, this is kind of the standard GraphQL client for working with GraphQL data, uh, especially in React applications. So I think we did this previously in a couple of projects. Let's look at the, the blog here. Um, was it this one, the GraphQL authentication? I think in this part, so this is the this was the podcast application that we built. We yeah, here we go. We set up uh, GraphQL uh, data fetching with Apollo client in a Next.js app. So um, let's just go through the steps here. Basically, what we're going to do is install Apollo clients, and then in the underscore app uh, .js file in Next.js, uh, we're basically just going to inject this Apollo provider component into the React component hierarchy. Uh, so basically we're gonna create an Apollo client instance that's pointed at our GraphQL API, which ends up being deployed as a serverless function through Vercel and, and Next.js. That's just some endpoint. Uh, we create that Apollo client instance and then using the Apollo provider, inject that client instance into the component hierarchy. So then we can use the Apollo client React hooks later on in our application. So here's an example from the podcast app where we're using the use query hook to fetch some podcast data. Uh, so let's do this. So the first thing we need to do is uh, yarn add Apollo client. And then in underscore app.js, uh, let's get rid of our CSS since we don't need that. Uh, and here we're going to bring in Apollo provider. Apollo client, the in-memory cache. So Apollo client includes a cache. So it's going to cache our GraphQL queries for us. And then HTTP link from Apollo client. Um, and links are like Apollo clients networking middle layer, essentially. Uh, we can do a lot of different things with links and, and kind of string them together so we can have transformations uh, of various things for our GraphQL request cycle. Uh, the HTTP link just means that I want to connect to uh, a GraphQL endpoint over HTTP. Oh, and let me link this article in the chat as well. So this is just the one that I'm following that we wrote previously, looking at the setting this up for the podcast application. And by the way, feel free to drop any notes in the, the chat if anyone has questions or just wants to, to say hi. Uh, I am looking at the chat, so feel free to, to chat away. 
Uh, okay, and then let's create a function that is to create our Apollo client. I'm just gonna use a little slightly different syntax than what, I don't know, we wrote last time, that's fine. So this is gonna be a new HTTP link. And the URI is going to be, uh, what is it, slash API slash GraphQL, which is where our uh, endpoint for our GraphQL API is located. Uh, and then we'll return a new Apollo client instance, passing in that link, and then uh, we need to create a new instance of the in-memory cache. There's different caching options. We could even build our own caching layer if we want like a distributed cache or something like that, but we don't need to worry about that. We'll just use the, the in-memory cache. And then here for our app, I want to uh, wrap our component in the Apollo provider, passing in an Apollo client instance, component, spread page props, Um, oops, extra parenthesis. There we go. Okay, so that will inject our Apollo client instance. So now we can use the Apollo client uh, hooks in our. Uh, our index page here. So, good evening from Rotterdam, the Netherlands. Hey, great! Thanks for joining. It's uh, it's kind of late in the Netherlands, isn't it? It's like uh, it's what, like almost midnight. Cool. Thanks for joining. So we want to use query. This is the the use query hook, uh, the GQL template tag. Bring those in from Apollo clients. And this is, again, very similar to things we've done before for other applications. Um, and we need a GraphQL query. Uh, let's call this most recent query. And we'll wrap this in the GQL template tag to parse that. Uh, this also gives us syntax highlighting uh, in VS Code. Indeed, around midnight, or some sleep deprivation. Oh, well, cool. Yeah, I used to have uh, insomnia when I was younger, and uh, I don't know. I wasn't wasn't into watching Twitch live streams then. That would have been been helpful for me. Okay, so we need some, a GraphQL query. Uh, I think what we want to do is maybe let's fetch the most recent. Um, articles. So let's go to slash API slash GraphQL. Oh, and we need to start our dev server again. So what I want to do now is write a GraphQL query to find the, uh-oh, got a server error. What happened there? Cannot find pages manifest. What does that mean? I don't know. Uh, what did we do? Cannot find pages manifest. So all we did was install Apollo client, wrapped our component. Uh, API GraphQL, module not found, Apollo link, it said. Oh, 
Really? That's odd. Is that not in s yarn add? Can install it. Link not found. Use client. Yeah, we did that, didn't we? Isn't that what I installed? Uh, yarn add client. Apollo client. Did that? Did we not run that? I thought we did run that. Maybe not. Oh, save one new dependency. Oh, maybe I didn't actually run that. Ha. <laughs> Uh, let's try that again. Much not found, yeah. Apollo provider, Apollo client. Oh, from Apollo, oh, I see what you meant. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. Uh, you said use client uh, instead of link here. Yes, thank you. I was trying to import these from the wrong package name. So Celius U1, you were you were way ahead of me there. Cool. Okay, let's try that again. So what I want to do is write a GraphQL query to find the most recent articles, I think. Um, if we look at the docs tab here, let me close this sidebar, minimize a few things here. Uh, so here's where our query is gonna go, by the way. Okay, so if I look at the docs tab, I can see, uh, okay, we've got um, an articles endpoint and we can, sort uh, by date created. So let's start with that. So we'll say articles, uh, options. Let's bring in, I don't know, maybe like the first 30 or so sorted by created in uh, descending order will give me the 30 most recent articles. Uh, and then we'll include in the selection set, how about title and the date created. Let's just make sure that's right so far. So what do we have? We have this week in Rust, which was submitted on the 23rd. Yeah, these are all submitted on the 23rd, which is just today, yeah, I think. Today is the 23rd. Cool, so that looks like those are the most recent. Uh, and then let's think about what we wanna show in our visualization. So we, we wanna show the article node. Uh, we know we have the tags, so like the description, is this about APIs, databases, JavaScript, whatever, we have, we have that. That's definitely relevant for our visualization. We have the user who submitted it. Um, so those all sound like good things to bring in. Uh, so we want to show when we like hover, so like a label, we want to show some labels for things. So we definitely want the title, um, the date created. Uh, we want the URL for the article. Uh, well, let's bring in the tags. Uh, the name of the tag, the user who submitted it. They have a username. And then we also have the avatar for users. Uh, so we can show that in our visualization as well. Maybe we show the user's avatar image um, for articles they've submitted. So here's a user. That's, I think this is the, the default one that you get by Lobsters, but you can also set a custom avatar. Cool, and then I'm also gonna bring in the type name, sort of meta field for each one of these, so that 
when I'm working with the data, uh, I'm going to have to sort of parse this data and get it in the nodes and links array that React Force Graph expects, like this, this structure here. Uh, so I'm going to bring in the uh, type name for each of these so I know what type of node it is. Cool. So Mario says, uh, always a pleasure. Near for J, React Apollo, React Force. Use all of them. Great. Cool. What What are you building, uh, Mario, with with all of those tools? If I can ask. Uh, question from Karan: Is native Near for J better than Sandbox? Because Sandbox hangs up a lot of the time. Yeah. So Sandbox Near for J Sandbox is like a um, very resource constrained, almost like a, think of it as like a initial experience trial version of Near 4 J. It's really for learning some concepts. Um, so each sandbox instance is uh, available for things like three days. You can send for a week, something like that. Um, but we spin those up in Docker containers that have very limited resources because uh, they're intended to be used with kind of small data sets and uh, sort of not a whole lot of horsepower, I guess, to do lots of, of interesting things. So you may run into, yeah, some uh, slow response times uh, and, and things like that. What I would suggest is instead of Sandbox, um, if you haven't tried Near4j Aura, uh, I would give Aura a try. That is uh, the database as a service for Near4j. And there's a, there's a free tier kind of similar to Sandbox uh, but with the Aura free tier, it stays around in perpetuity. So it stays around forever. So uh, unlike Sandbox, which expires after a few days, your Aura free tier instance um, is around forever. So you can keep building applications with it. Um, so I'd give that a try if you run into to issues with Sandbox hanging. Cool. Uh, Karan says emojis. Yeah, we don't, we don't have, I mean, if, if someone includes an emoji as part of the title, uh, we'll have it in the title string. Um, otherwise I don't think we have specific, um, emojis connected to our articles. Okay. So here's our query. This is going to give us the 30 most recent articles. Let's plop that in here. And now let's get rid of the hard coded data uh, that we have here. And let's see. So we're going to execute a GraphQL query. And then I think what we want to do is take the result of the query, so the, the response data, and let's save that in a React state variable. So let's bring in uh, use state and let's create that down here. Um, the Let's call it graph data, I guess, for our, our state variable. So uh, the use state hook in React allows us to declare state variables, and then we get a function to update that state variable when we call use state. And then what we pass to use state when we uh, create the, the state variable is the initial value. Uh, and so the initial value, I guess, let's just create our an empty object that has the nodes and links arrays in an object, but it's just empty. So initially we have no data to display, but we are going to now use the use query hook to run our, what do we call it, most recent query. Um, and then this is something I learned uh, actually not that long ago is we can also pass uh, an uncompleted handler callback 
um, when we uh, when we set up this use query hook. And in this case, we want to say when the data comes back from running our GraphQL query, then call set graph data to update the graph data react state variable with the data that comes back from our GraphQL query. And then we'll pass graph data to our force graph component. Now this is not quite going to work because this is the format of the data coming back from this GraphQL query. But the React Force Graph component expects data like this, this nodes and links array. And that's not what we have. So we're going to need to write a function that is going to you know, format this data, we can call it. Uh, format data. It's going to take some data. And it's going to sort of parse the data that comes back from our GraphQL query and restructure that into the format that our React uh, force graph component expects. Uh, so we'll write that function next. Uh, Karan says, uh, so this is about using Sandbox and Aura, the sample notebooks are available in Sandbox only. Yeah, that's a good point. So, um, so Sandbox has these really cool sample data sets. And then these like browser guides that walk you through uh, how to explore and query that data set using Cypher. Um, currently, Neo4j Aura does not have that, um, although I think something, uh, something might be in the works there for a different sort of getting started experience for Aura Free, uh, I would imagine. Something like that would make sense. But you can, so I'll link this Neo4j Graph Examples repo. Uh, so you can bring in those data sets and the, the browser guides in Aura uh, as well. So like they're all, the, the data and the guides are all available in this Neo4j Graph Examples GitHub org. So like here's the, uh, the movie recommendations one. Um, the, uh, where's the data? The data is here. So all you have to do is like drag, uh, this dump file into the aura console to load the data. Uh, and then the guide is available by running this command in near for J aura. Uh, here we can do, do it for this one. Uh, oh, my password. Here's the password. Uh, so where was it? Over here. So this colon play command, this will load the browser guide. Uh, just exactly like what we have in Sandbox. So that, that, that that's one option. Um, if you still want to access these browser guides and the data set. Um, maybe just check out the graph examples uh, repo. But yeah, I would imagine uh, that something uh, might be changing with that initial aura free experience um, sometime soon. But yeah, that, that, that's a really good point about the, the difference between aura free and sandbox. Um, okay. So rich, rich says, uh, is the state so we can periodically fetch and extend the graph or for storing the transform data? Yes. So, uh, for the former, I mean, I mean, I guess for both, we're, we're, we're we are going to store the transform data there, but, uh, one benefit that we have is that, uh, 
I'll have my graph visualization and then I want to like click on one of the tags to bring in more data. Uh, and so what I'm going to do behind the scenes for that is run a GraphQL query that's going to fetch some more data. And then, yeah, I'll just update this graph data state variable when that data comes in and then that'll re-render um, my visualization. So yeah, exactly. Uh, Mario, uh, oh no, one from Conrad first. Uh, Con so Conrad says, is it possible to expose the Neo4j GraphQL endpoint so it can be consumed by a language like Elixir? Um, I'm not sure what the s state of GraphQL clients in Elixir look like, but yeah, I mean, you can query uh, a GraphQL endpoint just as a HTTP request. So like if we look at um, at the console, when we run this GraphQL query, it's just sending um, this HTTP post uh, request with our query um, in the payload and that just comes back as JSON. So yeah, I would imagine Elixir probably has some GraphQL client uh, package, but if not, yeah, you can just make a uh, HTTP request to your GraphQL endpoint uh, and work with the data that way. Uh, cool, so Mario um, building a solidary chain project. Oh, cool, focus on using Near4j using Hyperledger in the past, and now using the Neo4j GraphQL library. Sweet, that sounds awesome. Um, that sounds really neat. I haven't done too much uh, with crypto, uh, blockchain, Web3 type things, but I, I hear a lot about it. So cool, that's, that's great you're using uh, Neo4j and GraphQL with it, that's neat. Cool. Yeah, good good questions. Thanks. So let's write this format data function. Um, we know the structure of the data coming in. We know what we want it to look like. So there's a few ways we could do this. Um, I let, let let's go through. I guess maybe let's just iterate through our articles array. Uh, Maybe that's the, the simplest way. Uh, so first of all, I guess if we don't have any articles, then um, return nodes and links right here. Uh, but if we do have Articles. Let's let's just use a for each loop through this. I I think we could map through this, but um, let's just do this in a for each, uh, and then add things to our nodes and links uh, array. That's probably probably the simplest. Um, okay, so the first first we're gonna push an object onto our nodes array, and we definitely want the ID. So the ID is, did we not include that? Oh, we didn't include that in our query. Let's get that. We want the ID, that's important. So the ID, that that's the one uh, field that React force graph uh, expects every node to have. So we definitely want that. Uh, we want the URL, bring that through. And type name, we'll bring that along and we'll bring along the title. We could probably just push the object on, but uh, I wanna be explicit so we know exactly what we're bringing in and I guess make sure we're not missing anything. Uh, okay, and then, so that's the article node, and then we 
have um, the user, I guess. Um, let's add that as well. Uh, so the user, because it's this node structure that React Forcegraph expects, so it needs to have an ID that's going to be the article dot user dot username. Uh, make sure you've got that. Yep, here's user username. Cool. And their avatar a dot user dot avatar and a type name. Uh, Rich says, could you use the Apollo in-memory cache and run local GraphQL queries against the cache data to transform it? Um, I think so. Internally, the cache is storing the data as nodes. Yeah. Yeah, that is a good question. So I think Rich is suggesting um, instead of explicitly transforming the data like this to instead... Uh, do a local query against the cache. Um, I have only sort of done that kind of thing, I guess, when you're like, when you want to update the cache after a mutation or something like that. Um, but yeah, I would imagine you could do something similar to kind of transform the data. That's, that is an interesting idea for sure. I'm going to continue down the path of uh, explicitly transforming it, though, <laughs> in this function. Um, cool. So now, so that's our the user node, the article node, and then now we can add a link to this links array, which has a source, uh, which is going to be, uh, I guess, the user. and the article. So let's, let's stop there and see if this is going to give us what we want. Um, that's not, that's not going to be everything we want to visualize from the GraphQL query, but let's see if we can just get some data on the screen. So then we, we want to call when we, when we're calling set graph data to update the graph data state. Uh, let's call this what do we call it? Format data. I think was the name of this function. Uh, I'll open up a new tab here. So we still have playground, and I don't. See See, do we have an error in the console? What happened there? Uh, if we refresh. I don't see an error. So I see that we are running. Oh, I'm not returning. Our format data function is not returning anything. So that's not good. So we want to now return an object that has our nodes and links. There we go. Cool. So we've got we've got nodes and links. We can't really tell what they are though. Let's let's take a look here at uh how do we style these things? So node styling, node label. Oh, let's let's add a node label so we can at least like see what uh, see what the ID, I guess, of the node is is what we want here. So the node label is A stringer function, object accessor function, or attribute for name. 
shown in label. Oh, so if we just want the ID, we can just give this the string ID. Yeah, there we go. Cool. So, oh, so, so the ID of an article is the ID of it. We probably want it, want the title or something, but we can see for the user anyway, the username. Let's change the, the coloring. Uh, so node color, node color auto, I think is what we want. So I think we can do auto coloring by type name. Node auto color by type name. So this should assign color to the node based on type name. No, oh, node auth, node auto, not auth. Yeah, there we go. So now usernames are dark blue and articles are light blue, or maybe the other way around. Uh, yeah, cool. Okay, let's um, let's go back to our format data function to add tags. I think that's what we're missing here is tags. So we have the user, we want the tag. Uh, so so we're going to iterate through the tags. And so, so this is for a specific article. Um, so like this one just has one tag rust here, but this one has multiple tags. So we want to add a node for each one of these tags to our nodes array. So we'll say nodes push. Uh, where the ID is going to be the name of the tag, and then we'll also bring in type name. And then also for the relationship, we're going to add an object to the links array where the source is the article and the target is the name of the tag. So now we should have tags. Cool, there we go. Java, PLT. But you notice there's a problem here. So I have a Java node here that doesn't, it's not connected to any articles. Um, but that should never happen, right? Because I'm I'm only adding nodes when they're connected to an article. And we see here we have a duplicate. So here's Java, uh, but here's another Java. Here's the Java. So this, I guess, is happening because we're iterating through this tags array for each article and adding the tag to our nodes array regardless. We're not checking uh, to see if that node already exists. Uh, so let's make sure we're only adding unique tags to our nodes array. There's a few, a few ways to do this. I, I think my standard way to do this would be to use a, a set data structure. Um, JavaScript has a set, but the set data structure in JavaScript doesn't allow us, I think, to override the comparators. So it works for values. So if I was just adding um, strings or something to a set, it would be able to say, yep, this string already exists. I'm not going to add that again to the set. But because we're adding objects to represent the nodes, then um, that's not going to work with a, a JavaScript set data structure because it's com uh, comparing references to the object, basically. So anyway, um, so instead, I think we'll use Lodash. Lodash is this really cool utility 
uh, library for JavaScript uh, that I think some has some unique unique by I think is this array method. Let me zoom in a bit. Unique by yeah so. We should be able to call unique by on our array and then specify the property that we want to use for the comparator function to identify uniqueness. Uh, so let's install Lodash. I could install, I think Lodash also has packages uh, that don't include everything, but that's fine. We'll just install all of Lodash, which says unique by, yeah, exactly. You knew, knew exactly what we were going for. So let's bring in Lodash. Um, and then here we can say that nodes is going to be unique by, so we'll call that load s function, pass, pass in our nodes array, and then say we want to use the ID uh, value to identify uniqueness. So let's see if that solved our problem. Cool, so now it looks like all of our nodes are connected. So I don't see any like indication that there's a duplicate uh, Java tag that's not connected to an article. Cool. So that's good. Um, we've got our basic force graph. Uh, we can see the, the tags, the user, and so on. What I want to do next is bring in more data. So if I like double click on a node, let's say I want to read more Linux articles, uh, then I want to bring in more article nodes and show those in the graph. Um, so let's see how we can do that. I guess the, the way to start there is figure out what GraphQL query we're going to run when I click on one of the tag nodes. So if I want more Linux stories, um, what GraphQL query am I going to run? Well, um, I guess another thing to keep in mind is that it'd be nice if I could reuse this format data function since I wrote this kind of explicitly to, to work with articles. Um, it, it also occurs to me that we could write this in a more generic way because the representation in GraphQL of nodes here in this document structure, um, it's kind of implies that there's a relationship if it's a, a subset of the document, right? Um, so we could write this in a more generic way, uh, but maybe I'll, maybe I'll leave that as an exercise uh, for next time. Um, what I want to do though is, okay, so I know what the tag is. So go find other articles that have that same tag. Um, so for this, we can take advantage of the where argument. So if we look here at articles, it takes a where argument uh, that allows us to filter based on property values. Um, but I can also do nested filters to say, find me articles that are connected to a certain tag. And so this way, uh, we can have the same 
data structure coming back from our GraphQL query, starting at the articles um, entry point and just pass that data to this format data function and update our state and re-render our visualization. So it's gonna be something like this. Um, we know we want to uh, sort in descending order based on the created date. So I want, I still want like the, the most written ones. Christian says, yeah, he's written the, the generic approach of this in the past. Yeah, I, rem I remember that one. Uh, that was a, a demo that you did. Was that was that for the, the nodes presentation with Regraph? Um, I think I remember that. Um, yeah, so you have to make some assumptions that don't always hold up for all data. Yeah, so like, so like in this case, what we'd have to assume that we always have this ID field, um, which I guess... I guess we could write the GraphQL query so that we're always aliasing anything to the ID field, some, some, something like that. But yeah, that's a good, that's a good observation. Is that Christian? Is is that um, example that you wrote? Is that online somewhere? Can you can you link to that? I think that'd be cool to see. So we know we want to sort articles in um, descending order, and what should we do? Maybe add like like ten. So when I when I double click on um, an article, I want to see the most recent ten for that tag. Or when I when I click on a tag, I want to see the most recent ten other articles connected to that tag. That that seems uh, like a good place to start. Um, okay, so that's the the sort and the limit. The other piece we need is the filter. So we're gonna say where, uh, and I can do this in a nested structure here. So I'm gonna say where um, tags name is, let's just hard code in here, databases, databases. Uh, what did we do? We articles where tags name. Oh, no, that's right. Oh, I removed options somehow. Options, there we go. Okay, so this should give me the 10 most recent articles that are connected to the tag database. Uh, Rich says, are we gonna start offsets? So if we double click the same node twice, it'll continue fetching more. Yeah, we should we should do that. Let's, um, let's set up this basic version first and then uh, take a look at offsets. And I'm gonna copy the selection set here. We, I should probably move this into a fragment um, or something like that, but uh, this is fine for now. So we want the same selection set from our previous query. So we're bringing users, tags, and the article. Cool. Um, and let's switch this around so that we are using variables for our GraphQL query instead of just hard coding databases because we're going to need to change that. Uh, so we'll call this what articles by tag and declare a GraphQL variable. We'll just call it tag. That's going to be a string. And we're gonna use that here. So this is gonna be tag. And then let's test this for the variables we're gonna pass. We're gonna pass tag. Uh, let's search for API this time, get some different results. Yeah, okay, cool. Great, so let's copy this.
And let's define, I guess, just another query here. So let's call this more articles query. Cool. Uh, so what we're going to do here, so we only want to execute this more articles query when some action occurs. So in this case, when we when we click on a tag node. Um, and unlike the use query hook, which executes as soon as the component loads, where's our use query? Here's our use query. Uh, we're going to use a different hook called, is it use lazy? Use lazy, use lazy query, I think. Let's look at the Apollo docs here. And something lazy. Yeah, use lazy query. That's the one we want. Christian says, nice stream. Cool, thanks. Glad you joined today. Um, okay, so we want to bring in use lazy query here from Apollo client, use lazy query. And then, uh, so when we set up this hook, this will give us a function that we can call when we want to execute that GraphQL query. Uh, so we're going to say, what does this look like? Load greeting. So looking at the example. Yeah, okay, so we get back um, a tuple. First element is going to be the function to call. So we'll call this load more articles. And then we have called loading and data. So if we're in a loading state, if the function has been called or not, and then the actual data, uh, use lazy query. We need to pass in our GraphQL query, which is we called more articles query. And then I'm gonna use this, the same thing we did here, where we just set a callback for after the query is completed. That's probably the simplest thing to do here because what. We'll, what we want to do is update the graph data state variable, the React state variable. Um, so let's just, yeah, define that in a callback. That seems like a good idea to me. So on completed uh, gets past some data. And let's see. First, I guess we're going to call the format data function. So, so I guess, I guess we're going to call the format data function and then do like a, like a spread on those two arrays with our, um, with our node and link data. So let's say new subgraph is the result of passing data to our format data function. And then we'll call set graph data. So set graph data, this is the function that's updating our graph data react state variable. And this has nodes and links. And here we're gonna call that low dash unique by to dedupe any of our duplicate nodes by ID. And here we're gonna spread our current nodes. So, so what's currently in the graph data state variable and combine that with our new subgraph nodes and we want to use the ID value to identify uniqueness. And then we don't need to dedupe our links, 
but we do need to spread on these. So let's combine graphdata.links, our current links, with our new subgraph links. And we need a comma there. Uh, and we're saying data has already been declared. Oh yeah, I, I guess I'm not really using this for anything, but let's just alias that to new data. In case, I don't know, maybe we wanna do something with that. Uh, okay, so we have this load more articles function, but we're not calling it. Um, so, Let's jump back to the docs here. And there's a click handler, I'm sure, on node click. Yes, so on node click is a callback function that's passed a node and event. Okay, cool. So we'll pass that on node click prop is a callback function that's passed a node and an event. And let's let's just log the node first. Make sure this works. So uh, let's get the console up and click on a node, cool. So when we click on a node, it gets logged. Okay, cool, the on click works. Rich says, you could store the state as two maps of node ID to node object, node source. Then you can save deduping, pass it as map.value, yeah, that that would work too because then um, basically the key of the object by ID is gonna take care of any deduping. Yeah, that sounds very reasonable as well. Yeah, cool, good idea. Um, I guess we wanna make sure that we're only calling our load more articles function when we click on a tag, like if I click on the article, it's not really clear what to expand. So I I want to check that the type name, so here we have the type name. So in this case, I clicked on the video tag node. Make that a little bigger. So I guess the first thing we'll do is if the type name is tag, then we'll call load more articles. And we need to pass the GraphQL variables because we need to say, hey, this is the video, the API with the database tag, whatever it is. So we need to pass the value for that. So variables tag is going to be uh, so the value of the tag we're storing here is the ID. So here you can see ID video. So this will be node.id. Okay, so if I click on, clicked on Android, oh, maybe I need to refresh. Did that not load my update? Let's see. Here's web, if I click web, there we go. So now, math, so that brings in 10 more math articles, AI, there's bringing in more AI articles. We're also bringing, the, the graph jumps around a little bit because we're, we're also bringing in, for each of those articles, the user that submitted it and the tag. So instead of just like expanding directly from the tag node that we click on to the articles, we're also bringing in other nodes as well. So it kind of kind of jumps around a little bit, I guess, which 
I don't know. I think that's that's okay. It's, pr- it's probably worse for these ones that aren't aren't connected, and then they get sort of sucked in. Uh, let me click on those. Uh, okay, so that is some basic functionality. So we've got we've got our data from GraphQL to populate the graph viz. Uh, nothing happens if we click on something and isn't a tag, but if we click on the tag nodes, then we're bringing in more articles for the tag we click on. That, that's okay, but I'm not really happy with the way that we're representing the nodes here um, as circles. Like I can't, I can't really look at this at a glance and, and kind of like derive any meaning from this. Um, so, oh yeah, the other the other thing we should do is while we're in the the on click handler is when I click on the article, then I want to I want to go to that article because I guess the whole point is to to find interesting articles and, and things for me to read. Uh, so let's update this to say uh, if the type name is an article, not articles, article, then uh, window dot open node dot no not ID is it it's just URL I think uh, yeah let's do that in a new tab okay let's try that so now here's a tag so I click on the tag that should give me more articles cool so that works but if i click on the article it should open in a new tab with the actual article okay cool cool so that that's good but right so, so like i was saying like I'm, I'm not really happy with how how we're representing the nodes here like uh i think there's a, a better way that we could visually represent the nodes um, I guess w- one thing we can do is we have the avatar for the users. So we could use the, the image of the avatar. Um, but I, I also want, I think maybe like a text representation. Um, I think there's an example of this text as nodes. Yeah. So something like this where the node, I think for tags, this makes sense. And I think also for article title, this makes sense as well um, so that I can look at the graph and I can see the title of the article without having to hover over it. Uh, so let's take a look at the source for this one, for this example text as nodes. And, and again, let me drop a link to this page. So this one is the, the, the force graph package where we're working with the react force graph package, which is just a wrapper around this. So these, the example, let's look at the source here. The example is going to not be react specific, um, but that's fine because this, this should be pretty easy to figure out what's going on and convert to our React format. Basically, in, instead of calling these methods, uh, these values are passed as props when we call the uh, the force graph component here is the difference. Um, if we look at what's going on here, so graph data, yep, passing some data, yep, we do that here. Uh, Auto color by group. Yep, we're doing an auto color by. Uh, but then it's calling this node canvas object method. So what's going on there? Well, we said earlier that there's a few different versions of this library. There's one for uh, the 2D, uh, 2D rendering, which uses canvas. 
Uh, and then there's a 3D version which uses uh, WebGL and specifically 3JS, so that's GPU accelerated. We're, we're using the 2D Canvas version. Um, Canvas, if you're not familiar with Canvas, it's an HTML5, I guess, HTML5 element uh, for rendering pixels, basically. Um, I guess you could compare it to SVG, but one of the big differences is that Canvas, I think, is in general supposed to be faster than uh, SVG, and Canvas has a bit different uh, API. I was I was looking at, let's see if I can find it. Um, there was a, a good Mozilla tutorial on Canvas. Here it is. Uh, so this this talks about how to use Canvas just in general um, for drawing shapes and text and, and things like that. Uh, basically, what's going on, though, in... Where's our example? In Forcegraph. What's going on here, though, is we basically can use this node canvas object function to now work with the canvas context for how we actually want to draw each node. Um, so by default, we are rendering things as circles, uh, but we can essentially override that by calling this node canvas object function and specifying with the canvas API what we want to draw for any node. Um, so let's use this as a guide here. So this one, this is for the text representation. So let's kind of use this as um, an example. And now let's, where are we here? Let's kind of override the node canvas object. Uh, is a prop. It's going to be a function that is past the node, the context, and global scale. So I guess global scale is what, like the zoom level, something like that, sort of. And in the case of, let's see, if the node uh, type name is a tag, uh, or I guess if it's a, article, then let's render it as text. Uh, so I think, I think I'm pretty much just going to use what we have here. So the label, it's going to be the node ID, font size. So we'll use this as a, a starting point, and then maybe uh, we will adjust some of these things. I don't know too much about Canvas, so uh, we'll have to see what we end up with. So the font is what font size. PX sans serif, okay. Setting font, I'm gonna calculate text width, context measure text based on the label. Okay, so looks like there's some methods on the canvas context objects to calculate based on the label we wanna display how much space it's going to take up. That's nice. Uh, and the background size calculation based on the size of the text we're going to display. OK, that makes sense. And then this is what some, some padding, I guess. 
So we have a little bit extra for the background around the text. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. And then the fill style. So so basically, I guess we're gonna what like draw draw a rectangle um, with a background color and then uh, draw some text in it, essentially. So the background style is going to be a somewhat transparent white. That looks looks reasonable. Uh, and then fill rect. So the the area for what we're going to fill based on our calculations earlier for the background dimensions and uh, the X and Y coordinate for our node. Cool, that looks dimensions, that looks good. If I can spell correctly. And node dot Y minus B, C, K, G dimensions. Or the y value okay so that's the basically just the white background and then some basically styling for the text so center text align middle or baseline middle and fill style, fill style that says node dot color. I don't think we have a color, do we? Um, oh, although we did say color by auto color by. I wonder if that assigns us a color automatically. Well, that'd be nice. So we'll try that. Uh, and then fill text with the label and then where we have the X and Y positions. And then, oh, and then we're setting this B, this background dimensions to be used in this node pointer area paint. So the, the node pointer area paint, this is basically just uh, so that we know when we're clicking uh, how much space this node should be taking up, I guess. Uh, so we're like caching this background dimension calculation. Okay. Um, let's see what that does. Ooh, look at that. So, oh, but we're showing the ID. I don't want to show the ID of the article. I want to show the title. Yeah, there we go. Oh, undefined. Uh, oh, uh, can we do this? Yeah, there we go. So if it's a article, we'll show the title. Um, if it's a tag, we'll show the ID. Um, okay, and, and note we're note we didn't we, we overrode this node canvas object, so we we no longer get that default circle representation for the node. So that's why we don't see user um, because we're, we're only, we've only defined what the node canvas object is doing. If it's a tag or an article, we're not doing anything for user yet, but, but that's okay. That's expected. Um, so now we can see the, and we did that coloring grouping did work. So we didn't have to override the color. That's cool. Uh, do it. Does our click, our click doesn't work because we didn't, Let's add this part, the node pointer area paint. Let's add that. Node pointer area paint gets a node, a color. Oops. This is a prop. So that's a prop that gets a function, node, color, context. And what's going here? We're just uh, 
not we're just using the background dimensions that we already calculated above. BC KG dimensions. Checking that we actually dimensions, checking that we actually have them. Uh, and then if we do, calling fill rect on the canvas context, BCKG dimensions for X and Y. Okay, so now if we go back and now if we click on a tag, hopefully we can add data. Yeah, there we go. So I clicked on art. We've got more art articles, email, got more email articles. If we click on an article, it loads the article for us. Cool. So that's that this, I think it, it's a little more crowded. I mean, I, I think we need to think more about how we're handling like collision and stuff. Cause, cause things are, are kind of overlapping a bit, but I think we, I think this is a lot more usable than just the circle representation for nodes, um, where I couldn't really tell without hovering over each one, like what's going on. The circles are useful when I'm interested in like, what is the structure of the larger network or something like that. But for these kind of interact and interactive visualizations, I think this text representation is a lot more useful. Um, let's get our user avatars in here though. So for node canvas object, we're, so for tag and article, we're handling that case, but we're not handling uh, where node type name is user. So here, what, draw the image, um, which I think there's an example. I'm going to go back to the examples to try to figure out how to do this. Um, I'm sure we're going to basically do, do something very similar to what we're doing with manipulating the canvas context, uh, where we're drawing text with the canvas context and instead draw the, the image. Um, here we go. Image images as nodes. Yeah. Something like this. This is, this is exactly what we want. So we have the user's avatar. We're going to show the avatar image images as nodes. Let's look at the source for that. They have, they have some random data. That's fine. Node, node canvas object. Yep, that's what we want. Uh, is past an image. Oh, I see. So image is all in this case is already a. Um, already an image. Oh, I see. Already an image object from the file here. Okay, cool. We can, we can work with that. We have the URL for the image. So in our case, um, I guess the first thing we want, the size, what do we do the size for? Oh, the size is used in the calculation. Okay. So size is 12. That's what the example is using. That sounds reasonable. Um, we don't have the image object already, so we need to create a new image. And then I think, uh, I think it's image dot source is what you set. And this is, uh, HTML image, image tag. Oops. I don't want this one. I want the Mozilla one. Um, oh no, not. ING. Oh no, not HTML, JavaScript. Yeah, this one. Yep, 
yeah, new image, and then yeah, you call image.source. Yeah, image.source is what node dot, did we just call it avatar, I think? Avatar, and then we just, what, call context.drawImage, something like that. Draw image. Drawing the image past that, and then we know the X position of the node. We'll scale that according to our size variable. So we might need to tweak that if, if this turns out to be huge. I don't, I don't know how big this is going to be. Okay, let's have a look. Cool, now we've got avatar images for our users. So some of them, some of them have the, these default, I think these ones are kind of like the default ones that are generated. Um, but yeah, we've got some, some users who uh, set their own. Let's add some more, add some more articles here. We'll see what some other avatars look like. Yeah, there we go. Cool. So I think this is pretty good for a first stab here. Um, there are, there are some other things we could do. I, I think we need to, we need to tweak the styling a little bit. Like, uh, you can see it's, it's pretty easy for these article titles to overlap. Um, and like, I think Rich suggested we should keep track of, uh, how many times we've clicked to expand right, right now you can only get what are we doing? 10, um, 10 articles per tag when you click it. Um, so like if I click Elixir, I'm only going to get, uh, get the, the additional articles the one time. So I should keep kind of a, a counter or something like that so that knows, Hey, I've now give me the next 20, some cursor there. Um, so there's, there's some things we can do here, but I think this is pretty good for now, so I'm going to call it uh, call it a day. I think. Oh no, I'm not. I lied. Let's let's get this deployed um, so we can actually work with this. So I have this hooked up to Vercel. Uh, yeah, this one, Lobster's Graph. But, so this is where, currently this is just hosting the GraphQL API, uh, which is at what, slash API GraphQL and the, the default page. Um, but this is connected to the GitHub repo, so I should just need to commit this and then should do a deploy for us. So let's add that, let's add package.json, let's add app index. Looks good. Commit. Uh, what should we call this? Add React Force Graph. Graph is. And push it up to GitHub. Oh, so um, the reason this complained is that I have the flat data action running. Um, and so that, that commits every hour. So that's committed some changes um, that I didn't pull. Uh, so that's why I had to do that uh, merge there, but that's fine. It's just some, just those JSON files. So there was no merge conflict. Okay, so that goes up to GitHub, which is this repo. Lobster's graph. Um, yep, there's my <laughs> my awful merge commit. Uh, that's fine. Here's the here's a link to the code. Uh, and so this is connected to Vercel. So if I go now to Vercel, let's just say that you have a 
build coming. Uh, this one was canceled. So this one says canceled because uh, where's the, how do I look at the settings on this? Settings, yeah. So we, we configured this. Um, we configured this to ignore any commits to the root directory. Um, so that's where the, the JSON is, those JSON files. And I don't want checking in those JSON files to trigger a new build of the project in Vercel because that happens every hour and that doesn't matter for how the next app is um, built and deployed. Uh, so that's, that's what the canceled build that it showed was. Uh, but why doesn't it have, uh, let's look at the commits. Why didn't it do a build for this one though? Uh, good question. Let's, Yeah, that's the previous one. Well, let's uh, let's just tell it to do another build. Promote to, to redeploy. Yeah, let's redeploy with the same source code. No, I want the newest code. Oh, so I guess I want the one that was canceled. Do, do, do. Deployment was canceled. I'm not sure why it didn't pick up my uh, my other changes, but I didn't format the code. So that's one thing we can change. And then let's check that in. Uh, okay. uh, so let's do another commit here. Format code, this time we'll do a poll. And now I have another merge. I wonder if it doesn't like the, the merge commits. Um, I think the merge commits are kind of hiding. Yeah. Okay, let's, Some I think something we configured was wrong here. So let's, let's get rid of our ignore build step. And this one, let's redeploy this. Okay, so so what should have happened there is we, we committed a change to GitHub and then we had that connected to Vercel and that should trigger a new build. But I had something wrong with the configuration for ignoring changes that I thought was just set up for when the JSON data is checked in, um, but I don't know. If we remove that, now it looks like it's working. So now Vercel is building our next app. So once this is done deploying, then we should be able to see that graph visualization. Cool. Wave says this would be nice for a network channel of YouTube videos. Yeah, that's a good idea. So maybe like pulling in all of the Neo4j uh, 
YouTube videos or, or maybe just a whole bunch of different videos and doing something similar. Yeah. I mean, I, I think this would work really for any sort of, um, knowledge graph type data that you're working with really. Um, cool. There we go. So now, so here's the link for this. Uh, so this should be public for anyone. And yep, yeah, if we click, yeah, it looks like it works. Cool. So you should be able to, to open that link. I, I pasted it in the chat and um, this will update every 60 minutes because we have the um, we have the flat graph GitHub action running that's updating the data in Neo4j Aura. And then that is going to update the graph visualization since we're going to be getting fresh data. So you should be able to visit this and see uh, basically the, I guess this won't, this is the, the most recently submitted. So it's not going to be the same as the lobster's main page, but it should be the same as the lobster's recent. So this page should match what we see here, just sort of in the, the graph representation. I guess maybe we, one thing we could also think about doing is um, doing one of these for the top feed, the top rated feed, instead of just the most recent. But anyway, that's, that's probably enough uh, for today. Conrad asks, how did I get the name Johnny Montana? Yeah, so Johnny Montana is my GitHub username. Um, Johnny Montana was, I don't know, a nickname that I had uh, as a kid. I will not tell you the origin of that. Uh, that's maybe for uh, another time that's not being recorded. But uh, yeah, it was a nickname I had as a kid. That was my, uh, as I was, was growing up, that was my like online persona um, on all the message boards and, and stuff. But uh, now I think it's just just my GitHub. Yeah. But yeah, that's a fun one. Cool. Uh, well, the code is already online um, in this Lobster's Graph repo and application is already deployed. Uh, so feel free to check that out. Um, I'll try to write up a blog post version of this and uh, link it here along with the recording. Um, but yeah, I think that's good. So just to kind of recap what we did is we, we went from our GraphQL API that we built last time and we used the React Force Graph package uh, to build this interactive graph visualization, pulling in data from our GraphQL API so that we can visualize this knowledge graph of Blobster's data uh, and explore it in, I'll say, the start of what I, what I think is a more sort of intuitive visual way to to explore this data set. Um, going forward, I, I think we can improve the styling of this. I think we could also add some other visualization components as well, maybe like uh, some bar charts or something showing like the most common tags or something like that. We could also maybe think about embedding the article in an iframe or something rather than loading it in a new page. Mm, something to Something to think about. But anyway, um, thanks everyone for joining today, and uh, thanks for uh, for chatting along in in the chat. That was uh, that was a lot of fun, uh, and uh, we will see you next time. Uh, so, cheers, everyone! Bye bye.